Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. And welcome to Tuesday night. It's our favorite night of the week. We're sorry we're a few minutes behind getting started, but we're glad to be here with you on today uh, for our Bible study night. Uh, we're continuing our discussion on network evangelism. Network evangelism. Why is that so important? Why? Because God gave us a great commission, and that commission was that we would go forth and make disciples of all people. That our, our number one job is to go out and make disciples. If we're not making disciples, we're not doing the work of the church. That's, that's hard, isn't it? I mean, it, it doesn't matter how much money we raise. It doesn't matter how many beautiful buildings we have. It doesn't matter how good our choir is. It doesn't even matter how good the preacher is. If we're not making disciples, we're not doing the work of the church. So we want to be more proficient as the people of God of how we can actually build the church, build the kingdom by making disciples. Can, can we help build the kingdom by making disciples? Now, here's the unfair part in that. If we just needed Jesus to be good and, and God to do his thing, it would not be a problem. But the, but the problem we have here is that he actually expects us to be a part of the process. Amen. He actually expects us to be a part. Matter of fact, he actually expects us to be in charge of the process. Uh, can I go a little deeper? If we don't do it, the job won't get done. Amen. Woo! I got to say that one more time. Amen. If we don't do it, the job just won't get done. See, see, there's no cavalry. There's no infantry that's going to come in and redeem the work that we didn't do. See, if, if we let the people of this generation uh, live and die without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, then we will have forsaken that generation to hell because we did not do the work of making disciples. That, I mean, Jesus is not going to say, uh, you all are not doing good enough, so let me come down and show you how to do it. Amen. He's not, he's not going to tag in. Uh, either, either we're going to do the job or the job just won't get done. Yeah. And see, when you, when you think about the fact that so many souls are hanging in the balance right now, how many people do you know right now that, that no, no judging and no shame, just that you know that they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You know that they're not saved. You know that they're not a Christian. You know that they're in jeopardy of eternal damnation. Now, some people don't believe in that. It doesn't matter if we believe in it or not. It matters if it's true or not. Mm -hmm. And see, if, if we think of all the people for one reason or another that are not a, 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 a Christian, that are not saved, and, and those are the people that we have been introduced to, and then you, and you, and you, and you know a whole nother group of people that are still not saved. And see, we are deciding that it's all right for them to go to hell. We are deciding that it's all right for them to go to hell. Pastor Cannon, that's kind of harsh because the decision is on them. They have the opportunity to accept Christ or they have the opportunity to not accept Christ. Well, let me change my scenario for you. Let's say that the building is on fire. The house is on fire. And they're in the house that's on fire. They don't know it's on fire yet, but they're in the house that's on fire. And in a moment, the entryway is going to be blocked with the flames so that they can't escape the burning building. They don't know that they're about to burn. But you know that they're about to burn. So if they don't get help, who's going to get them out of there? Nobody. They're going to burn in that building even though they don't know, even though they thought they were safe, 
even though they thought everything was going to be all right. And you are out here with the opportunity to save them. What would you do? What would you do? Would you run in and try to help? Would you call 911? Would you throw water on the fire? Would you do something to help that person that's stuck in their current situation to be free from the possibility of death and a horrible death in the fire of the burning building? And you can change it just by getting involved. Now, now you, it, it may be hard for you to get involved. It, it may, you might get smoke inhalation by getting involved. You might even get burned yourself by getting involved. It might cause you some pain and some suffering, but is it worth it? Is it worth it to help the next person if you have to suffer some in order for them to get out of the fire? And both of you live as you come out of the fire. The real heroes that we talk about are the people that run into danger to save people who can't get out of their situation without being helped. Are you a hero? Are you that type of person? Are you the type of person that's just going to see a person in danger and just say, it's terrible that they're going through that? It's hard that they're dealing with that. See, God is calling for a team of people that can help us to rescue people from their current condition. Now, now, now before we get real selfish, remember, somebody rescued you. Remember, you weren't, you weren't the easiest person to get saved. Remember, you didn't believe all of that stuff either. Remember, you were trying to live your own life too. Remember, you were going through the things that you were going through before you decided to really give your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and somebody had the patience and somebody was persistent enough and somebody kept coming back and kept talking to you and kept sharing scripture with you until the day that you finally accepted the truth. Mm -hmm. What if they gave up? What if they turned their back on you? What would you be at this point if it had not been for them being on your side? Mm -hmm. I know you're glad that the Lord was on your side, but the Lord used them. Mm -hmm. And see, that's the model that we have to put into motion is that God is, is not done reaching people. God is not done. We look at all of the crime and we look at the violence. We look at the racism. We look at the things that's going on in the world and we say the world is a terrible place. It's just horrible that people are so mean and violent and doing all these things. Well, they wouldn't do all those things if they were saved. Maybe if we get more of the people saved, then we would, have, we would reduce crime. If we get more people saved, we would reduce violence. We would reduce the number of murders. We would, we would reduce the amount of theft. All of those things, right? I know everybody's saved ain't right, but most of them are. So, so we can change that by just getting involved and, 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 and making sure that the next person changes. If they change, then we make the world a better place. There's a thing uh, you all know about the coronavirus and the COVID, and, and, the, and, the, and when there's a virus that hits a, a community, one of the uh, cures for that is what they call herd immunity. Herd immunity. That, that means that they want to bombard the community with people getting, getting it and getting over it. So if there's 100 people in the community and we can get 60% uh, of those people to get the disease and, and live, then they would develop a, an immunity. And when they develop the immunity and spread out, then we don't have to worry about everybody else getting it. That's herd immunity. That's not working real good with corona, but it works in the general senses of if everybody gets immune to it, uh, if everybody gets chicken pox, most people don't get chicken pox more than once. So if most of us have the chicken pox or we've had the vaccination, then we don't have to worry about catching it and spreading it. Yeah. That's herd immunity. So we can do herd immunity on salvation. Right. See, if, if we get more people in our community uh, saved, then, then that changes the face of our community. Mm -hmm. If we get more people in our community serving God, then we eliminate some of the problems that exist 
in our community now. Will you have other problems? Sure, but you don't have these problems. Mm -hmm. See, see, there, there's one thing to say that we're killing each other. Black lives matter, white lives matter, orange lives matter, everybody's life matters, then why are we taking everybody's life? Why are we shooting and killing and doing whatever else that we're doing? Why? Because we haven't changed our heart. We're more concerned about what's on the outside of the life than what's on the inside of the life. But if we change our heart, we'll stop killing everybody. Just go to the good old fashioned Ten Commandments and thou shalt not kill. Amen. But we got, we got to get to the point that we get over our issue. And our issue in the world is sin. Our issue in the world is the flesh. Our issue in the world is the works of the enemy and spiritual wickedness in high places, amen, that comes to attack the people of God and keep us in a place of bondage. But we are the people that are going to bring change. Who's with me? Who's going to help us to bring change? Who's going to be a witness? Who's going to be the, the tools and the instruments that God is using in the earth that's going to allow us to see the change that we really want to see? So, so that's what we're here to do. That's my, that's my long intro. Uh, that's what we're here to do is learn how to build the kingdom by making disciples. Now, here you are. Uh, this is you. Uh, yeah, that's you right there. I can spell that right. That's you. And, and, and you have a responsibility. Your responsibility is not to change the world. It's to change some disciples. You can't change the world because the world is too big for you. But can you change some disciples? So here's what we want to do. What we want to do is get you, young lady, can I have you as a volunteer right down in the front? Thank you. All right. This young lady here in the front, we would like to have you to get 12 disciples. Are you willing? Good. I'm glad you're willing to volunteer. All right. And so and what we're going to do is get you to get 12 disciples. But we're not going to do it all at once. You're going to get one disciple at a time, two disciples at a time, three disciples at a time. What we really want to do is get three disciples. And can, or can we do that? Good, I'm glad you said yes. And we're going to get those three disciples, and we're going to teach those three disciples how to get three disciples. Is that fair enough? So if we teach those three disciples how to get three disciples each, then we will have done a great job in building the kingdom, won't we? Because if you do that, then you have 12 disciples. What do you have to do? You got to get a disciple, you got to get three disciples, and you got to teach your three disciples how to get three disciples. Okay. Is that hard enough? I mean, we're not asking you to build a cathedral. We're not asking you to run a revival. We just need you to get three people and teach those three people to get three people. Now, it's, it's easier to get three people than it is to teach three people to get three people. Yeah. It's easier to get, and it ain't easy to get three, but it's easier to get three than it is to teach them to get three. But the game, you don't win the game until you teach your three to get three. So Marquise, if you got three, but one of your three never get three, that three don't count. You got to get a three that gets three. Why? Because you're trying to get 12 disciples. But what, what, what's going to happen when you, what is the game? The game is making disciples. Right. And so, so if you want to win the game, then the next person wants to win the game, right? Mm -hmm. So then the next person wins the game by teaching people to do what you taught them to do. And then, and then the people that they taught want to get what you got. And so then what they do is they teach people to teach people to teach people what they learn. And, and, and ultimately, we get a whole movement of people that are making disciples. And that's what we're doing now, right? Yeah. That's what we're doing now is we're teaching people to do what we've learned. We're teaching people to do what we've learned. What we've learned is to come to church. Okay. What we've learned is to sing and praise. What we've learned is to pray and fast. But what we have not learned is to make disciples. And so because we haven't learned to make disciples, then we're teaching what we've learned. And, and the vital part 
of our job has been neglected because we we never took the time to learn that. We learned the scriptures. We learned the Lord's Prayer. We learned the Ten Commandments. But we never learned how to make a disciple. Mm -hmm. And even that that was important. And even that that was a thing. And even that it was our job. If you think about it, if you think about it, we, we have been set up to go on the wrong path to do a kingdom job. Very quietly, uh, I like to look at the subtle things that the enemy does. Very subtly, he has kept us at bay by keeping us off focus. Yes, Lord God. We, we, we will do a mad musical. You can't, do, you can't beat us doing a musical. We can do a midnight musical, a sunrise musical. Uh, we can do a, 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 a full-on concert. We can have open mic. We can, we can put together a musical. But when we finish, we haven't done a great job of making disciples. We can run revival. We can do crusades. We can do conferences. We can even write books. And we write plays. And we do all those things. But we have not done a great job at making disciples. And see, now, now compare us to some other religious groups. Compare us to the Muslims. Compare us to the Seventh-day Adventists. Compare us to the Hebrew Israelites. Compare us to some, some of those other that are aggressively, aggressive, the Jehovah's Witnesses, thank you. They're, they're aggressively, actively trying to snatch people out of your church. They're trying to teach people that what you have said and what you have taught them is a lie. They're bringing information. They're bringing books. They're bringing magazines. They're bringing pamphlets. They're emailing. They're texting. They're calling. They're doing. They even bombard my sermons. And then while I'm preaching, sometimes they'll get on the message and, and try to get in and, and, and put in disinformation. Right. Because what they want to do is hinder you from becoming a Christian, and they want you to become whatever it is that they want you to become, And but they're actively doing it yeah. while we shout. Right. Amen. While we dance. Mm -hmm. They're actively out there saying, how many did you reach today? How many did you get today? Let me tell you who the best recruiter in the world is. Are y'all ready for this? The, the best recruiter in the world is Satan. Is who? Satan. Oh. Lucifer. Horns, tail, pitch bark. He, he is the best recruiter in the world. I'm telling you, he is relentless. Yeah, he is. He, he's doing it every way he can, on every platform he can. He doesn't care how old you are. He doesn't care how young you are. He doesn't care what race you are. He doesn't care what neighborhood you're from. He doesn't care how much money you got. He is after you. Yeah. And, 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 and statistically, he's winning. Hmm. Yeah. Statistically, he's winning. How do you know he's winning? Because statistically, out of the billions of people on the planet, the overwhelming majority of them are not Christians. So he's statistically winning the battle for souls in our lives. Look at your family tree. The overwhelming majority of the people in most of our family trees are not Christians, are not active churchgoers, are not saved, are not sanctified, are not active in ministry. Mm -hmm. We're doing, hey, look in the in the back seat of my car. It's a, hey, the white one. It, it, they're, they're actively uh, doing that and they're not interested in, in what we're doing. And that's bad. Because we got the best product but the worst sales force. And it doesn't matter how good our product is if we don't get out there and sell it. Hey, we got the best secret there is. I, I, I love the peace of God that passes all of understanding. Amen. I'm so grateful for God's peace. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and he has shown up in my life at multiple times in multiple places. And I'm so grateful for that peace abiding in me 
Amen. But most people don't have that peace. They want it, so they go out and they buy pills, and they buy alcohol, and they buy drugs, and they buy cigarettes, and then they buy candles, and, and incense, and all kinds of stuff trying to get the peace that God gives me for free. Yeah. Amen. And mine works. Right. Amen. <laughs> you get the aromatherapy, and, but you're still stressed. It smells good, but you're stressed. And as soon as the candle goes out, yeah. your peace goes out. Right. But this peace continues, yeah. abides, carries me, comforts me. Why wouldn't I want that? Amen. I do want that. Yeah. I just don't know that you have that for sale. Because we're not offering that. We're offering big hats and long dresses. We're offering uh, tight suits and and, and fancy cars. We're not offering peace. Right. We're not offering healing. Right. We're not offering deliverance. Right. We're, we're offering great entertainment. Amen. And beautiful settings. Amen. But we're not offering something that's real that will snatch me out of my current situation. And, and see, that's all about disciple making. Mm -hmm. That's all about disciple making. You can get off course and say, we disciple make so good that we got the game and gone with it. Yes, but the game is still going on. Speaking of the game, I'm a sports fan. Amen. And they have this thing called the Super Bowl. Amen. And in this thing called the Super Bowl, the Chiefs of Kansas City, uh, who did they play last year in the Super Bowl? Oh, yeah. The 49ers <laughs> from San Francisco. Why didn't I remember that? Oh, because they lost. Now, now, this is what's amazing. They, they lost, but they were winning. And they should have won. Yep. And they had a lead, a, a lead that should have been insurmountable. And they were way out there in front, in advance, on top of things. All they had to do is just not let them catch up. But you know what they did? Let them catch up. And when they let them catch up, then Kansas City Chiefs win. You know what happened? The game wasn't over. Amen. The game wasn't over. 49ers thought the game was over. But the game wasn't over. A few years before that, the Patriots was, was losing to the Atlanta Falcons. And you know what's interesting? The game wasn't over. And so the Patriots kept coming back, and they came back, and they ended up winning the game. And so that's two games that the team that was winning let the team that was losing come back and win the game. You know what we have in common? What? The same coach was the head coach of both of those teams in both Super Bowls that lost those games. Really? Wow. Same head coach. We have the same type of behavior that says that I'm, I'm winning, I think things are all right, I think I'm good, and then we let up. Yeah, that's true. And then as soon as we let up, the enemy has not quit. That's right. That's right. And then he starts coming back, and he starts gaining momentum. And then you start thinking, let me start going again, but it's too late because he's got momentum and then he begins to overrun you in your situation and you can't figure out what happened. How did things fall apart? We were doing so good. We started out with three members. Now we got 30 members. We have arrived. You have not arrived. You just started to build momentum. This is not this is not miraculous numbers. You ain't got three thousand members in the last sermon. Let's really do something impressive. But what happened? We started getting excited. Uh -huh. Look what happened. We got our three, and, and and since we got our three, and we taught our three to get three, we never taught them to do what we do. So because we never taught them to do what we do. Then, then the, the whole thing stagnated. And then even though it looks alive, the church was dying. Even though it looks alive, your ministry was dying. 
You had 12 people. It looked strong. You had 12 good people. But the 12 good people are only good if they're bearing fruit. Amen, Pastor Cannon. Thank you, y'all. Keep it down. It's, it's okay. Amen. The, the, the 12 good people are only good people if they're bearing fruit. And look at the history. Look at your experience. Look at some of your churches. What happens that makes people start to fall off? You stop bearing fruit. You stop having new faces. You stop having new members. What, do you still have a new members class? See, if you don't have a new members class, it's because you don't have enough members to have new members to have a class. You know why you don't have that? Because we've lost sight of the focus of bringing in and introducing new people to the kingdom. We think we've gotten it. We think we're there. And we're not there. You don't even know where there is. You don't even know how many people God is trying to add to the church. All right. But but what happened is we began to pick our winners. Somebody say, pick a winner. Pick a winner. Make sure you say that right. Don't get confused. We're picking winners. Winners. Amen. When, when you when you if, if you pick a winner too early, what happens is you begin to think that you got it. You think you're good. Uh, Cece comes in and Cece got four sisters and her mama and her auntie and her uncle and her baby daddy and, amen and then they got nine kids amen and then some cousins and all of them people come into the church and so what happens when all of those people come into the church it looks like we have a big church right. it looks like we have a big church because Cece this is Cece right here and, and Cece got all kind of stuff growing and then they got some babies amen and and all of this stuff is going on on the cc you see how, oh my gosh and then these people over here amen and some more and some more and some more all of them people is oh look at how many people we got we are doing it i don't even have to worry about the offering no more because we got so many people that the offering is going to be good. Until I make Cece mad. All right. And then one day I'm going to make Cece mad. That's right. And when I make Cece mad, this whole bunch of grapes yes, it does. is about to fall off the church. She's going to be gone and all them cousins and her baby daddy yeah. and then all that. And if you ain't careful, they're going to infect some of these other That's people right. that right. was on some of the other limbs and, and you will have lost half or two thirds of your church in a moment. Yeah. You know why? Because you thought that Cece was the answer. You said, CC has now taken me to the big leagues. CC didn't take you to the big league. CC is just doing her job. But you forgot what your job was. Amen. Your job is to get three people and teach those three people to get three people. Once you have gotten three people and you taught those people to get three people, your next job is to do what? Close, because say it again out loud. You got what's your first job? To get my three people. Get three people. Yeah. After you get three people, what's your second job? Teach them how to get three Teach them how to get three people. Teach them to get three people. And then what's your third job? To keep them, I guess. No. Nope. Ah, she she said your third job is to keep them. And I set her up because that's where that's exactly what we try to do. I get three people and I teach them to get three people, and then I try to keep them. That's not your goal, your job. Your job is to get three people, teach them to get three people, and then teach them to teach people oh, okay. to get three people. Okay. Your third job is to teach them to teach people to get three people. Now, I didn't say for you to get three people for them. So when did you start teaching them to be disciples? You just did. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. You just did. Okay. Because you taught them, you got three people, you taught them to get three people, and then you teach them to teach people to get three people. Okay. That, that becomes your job. Now, once you get three people and you've got your three people, what's your new job? You did those three things, what's your new job? Do it again! Do it again! Repeat. Do it again! I went through all three steps. 
I got that moving, now do it again. Now I'm going to get three more people and teach them to get three people and teach them to teach people to get people. And they go get three more people and, to, and do that again. So when you do that, the more that you do that, you broaden the base of your ministry. You broaden the base of your ministry. And, and by broadening the base of your ministry, you ensure the longevity of your ministry. We got a nice little engineer lady here, and she will teach you that if you're going to build a big building, the, the, the determination of what kind of building you're going to build is the strength of your foundation. I can't just go out there and build a real big building out there on the top soil. I, and I can't just build it on one brick. I can't just have one brick and then just say I'm going to build a 12-story building on top of one brick. Right. It don't work like that. I got to have enough foundation to support the, the, the growth of that building, right? So here's what this looks like. This looks like trying to build a 12-story building on one brick. And even though it's going to start going up like Jenga, it's going to start going up, but at a certain point, something's going to move. There's going to be a piece that moves, and the whole game will collapse. Isn't that something? You say, I just moved one piece. But the one piece that you move caused the whole game to collapse. Can, does this apply to me personally? Yes. Does this apply to, to my ministry if I'm not a pastor? Yes. Does this apply to my business? Uh-huh. Does this apply to me if I'm not in business? Yeah. Because you still have a building responsibility. You still have a building responsibility. Oh, you just one bad you just one bad client away from being out of business. Yeah, that's true. You just you you be dead all over the country. They, when they say your name, oh my God, no. Don't use them. Right. You just you just one bad experience. You one bad report from being away, being out of business. And they, and they say, no, don't, don't let that company come into your business. Don't let them come into your business. No. No, I, I, oh, I had all kinds of problems. And it's amazing. People will talk about that. Yeah, they will. Yeah. You know, because you know why they're talking about that? Because the leader is recruiting. <laughs> and what's his name again? Satan. Satan. He is recruiting. All he's doing is waiting on one opportunity to find something that he can use to tear down your network. And he wants to tear it down to ensure that you don't have success. <laughs> and where did, and how did he find it? Well, he huffed and he puffed. And he blew that house down, and that house was made of straw. But if you got a brick house with a broad, strong foundation, right. then you ensure that no matter how much he humps and, and puffs, even if a stone falls out, the house is going to stand. Right. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Right. It doesn't matter how mad the gates of hell get. It don't matter how many people come through the gates of hell. It don't matter what the gates of hell does, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against this church built upon the rock. So, so are you building a, 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 a strong foundation in your church, in your individual ministry, and by your own kingdom building assignment as a disciple maker? If you're not, you're probably losing. Let me go back down to the individual, because I uh, most of y'all think that I'm just talking to pastors. Well, let me help you as an individual. You know, when you first got saved, those of you that are saved, you can remember this. Uh, you, you gave your life to Christ, and you were so excited. You, you came home, and you were like, Lord, Jesus has changed me. I looked at my hands, and they looked new. Looked at my feet, and they did too. 
and, and I'll never be the same, and I'm so excited. You know what you wanted to do? You wanted to tell all your friends. You wanted to tell all of your family how excited you were that you have turned it around. You don't you don't drink no more. You don't smoke no more. You don't club no more. You you saved now. You sanctified, and everything is already. You was on fire. You wanted them to come to church with you. You wanted them to read the Bible with you. You woke up every day. You answered the phone. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. All of those things were going on, and then all of a sudden, you lost momentum. And when you stopped trying to reach people and tell people how good God was and all of those things like that, that's when you started to mess up. And yes, you did. And yes, you did. When you stopped, when you stopped sharing your testimony, when you stopped witnessing and, and telling of the good, that's exactly when the flesh began to rise again in your life. As long as long as you were out witnessing, bringing people to church, because you know what that? They hold you accountable. Yeah. Absolutely. They hold you accountable. You, you can't go out with them now. You can't turn up with them now because you was bringing them to church. So then they say, well, I guess you ain't going to the party. But what happened? You wanted to go to the party. And when you wanted to go to the party, then you was partying at the party. And then now your witness was lost because you, you got distracted. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But as long as you were witnessing, bringing them, keeping them, following up, doing everything like that, I'll make sure you come to church. I'm coming to pick you up. All those things. like You got to be at church if you're picking somebody else up. But when you stop picking people up, then it's easy for you to stay home. Yeah. When you stop making sure that other people are being engaged and other people are getting involved, then it's easier for you to, to say, well, I'm just going to chill this Sunday. And it happens. And the more it happens, it takes you down a, a slippery slope into the place that you become inactive. Yeah. And, then, and then your ministry begins to fall apart. Yeah. If you're not the pastor, you're still a part of the kingdom building. Amen. Your pastor is depending on you to help build the kingdom by making disciples. That's absolutely. Well, Jake at State Farm is there to get customers for State Farm. In brown khakis. In brown khakis. <laughs> Amen. They ask you that. They don't, you know, right. State Farm is not getting customers by themselves. That's why they hired Jake. Right. They hired Jake because they need Jake to go out and get new customers. Mm -hmm. And they take a Jake and put a Jake in every county. So that in every county you can give State Farm insurance. Right. Well, Jesus wants new customers. So he put you out there. He put you in your neighborhood. He put you on your job. He put you in place so that you can do that. Y'all have got me preaching on this and I ain't even got to my scripture. So so in Matthew chapter 10 <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10 I'm sorry. I, I, let, let me get this right quick. Matthew chapter 10 he says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples this is the first verse of Matthew chapter 10 he said, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Jesus called unto him 12 disciples. And then he taught them to make disciples. He gave them the authority to cure all manner of sickness, all manner of disease, and to cast out devils. Is that right? right. So, so what was what was it that he had that they had in their arsenal? Go out there, make disciples, cast out devils, heal the sick. Do it again. What you say? Repeat. Repeat. Go out there, cast out devils, heal the sick, make disciples. Make disciples, heal the sick, cast out devils. Heal the sick, make disciples. And, and you get my point. Right. <laughs> this is your primary product. When McDonald's started many years ago, when McDonald's, you know, the Golden Arches McDonald's, this is what they would pride themselves on. We sell hamburgers, fries, 
and shakes. That's it. Wasn't no, wasn't no Big Mac. It wasn't no Mighty Wings. It wasn't no McFlurry. We do hamburgers, fries, and shakes. Period. Come here and get a hamburger, some fries, and or a shake. That's what we do. But what they did was they did that all over the world. Right. And they did it more than anybody else did all over the world. So they became the largest franchise uh, of doing hamburger fries and shakes in the world because they were focused on reproducing themselves, not how much they sold. The product was the same. The product was consistent, but they were able to do it across the world. Our product, our Jesus disciples product, was cast out devils, heal the sick, all manner of diseases. That's what we do. 2020, we have a sick and shut-in list. I, I was reading in this thing, and I didn't find the sick and shut-in list chapter. And Jesus gave them power to have a sick and shut-in That's not what we were supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be unsicking them. If our job was to unsick them, why are we putting them on the list? We're chronicling them as being among the sick instead of driving out the sickness. We, we lost our focus on what we were supposed to be doing. Now, now, you guess what? Guess what? If I'm sick and can't get well, and you come and you pray for me and I get well, I'm coming to church. Amen. I'm coming to church. Amen. But guess what? I'm not well. And you did come pray for me and I got well. So guess what I'm not doing? I'm not coming to church because that stuff you're selling don't work. But what happened? Well, that's why uh, Apostle Talton don't want to go pray for the sick. Because she went and she prayed for the sick and it didn't work. How does she know it didn't work? She don't know if it didn't work. That person might just be in disobedience. But her job was to pray for the sick and, and, and cure all manner of diseases. Guess what happens? If what if 20 of us attack that prayer list? What if, what if 20 of us bombard that one soul that's sick. And just say, heaven said, you can't stay sick. I know Cece came yesterday, but I'm here today and we praying. And then and then Marquis coming tomorrow. And then Juanita coming the next day. And then Suge gonna come after that. And then Kayo coming after that. But we just gonna keep on praying. Cause because sickness can't stay here. We're not all right with sickness staying here. But when we when we begin to accept sickness and embrace it as a part of our church then we've lost our core principle that said that we were supposed to be curing sickness. Yes. Amen. We're supposed to be healing the sick right. and curing all manner of diseases. Yes. Amen. When, when we become comfortable with you remaining sick, we're not functioning as the body of Christ. We're not functioning as the kingdom of God because we do hamburgers and fries and shake and y'all out of hamburgers. When the devil is existing in somebody's life and we know it and we let the devil continue to reign in their lives, we now don't have hamburgers or fries. How do you know they possess with the devil? Look at them. Look at how they live. Listen to their speech. Look at what they do. That's not the spirit of God that's making them act like that. So what spirit do you think it is? Do they have to, before they got to be possessed with it? I mean, what do they have to do? Spit the pea soup before they're actually possessed with a devil? Or is it just because they use profane language? 
Or is it just because they're addicted to drugs? And it's really just the enemy that's brought that addiction on their lives. But what does it what does it take before we get involved? How bad does the fire have to be before we want to rescue them from the fire? We have three products. Hamburgers, fries, shakers. Cast out devils, heal the sick, cure all manner of disease. Make these disciples. When they went to city to city, he would send the disciples out. They would go out and heal the sick, cure all manner of diseases, cast out devils, and then the multitude would come out and they would hear Jesus preach. And then he'd go to the next city, and then the disciples would go out, and they would do that. And it was so good that when they went to a place and it didn't work, they were confused. Why is it that we couldn't cast the devil out in this situation? That devil was supposed to answer to us. Why didn't it work? It didn't work because these kind come out by fasting and prayer. That don't mean that you got to go on a fast and pray for three weeks before you go cast the devil out. That just means you should have already been fasting and praying mm -hmm. for the past three weeks so that when you got there, you were prepared to deal with the devil that was there. Mm -hmm. But you weren't prepared to deal with the devil that was there because you didn't have an evangelistic mindset. You were not thinking that I was getting here to cast the devil. The devil better not be here when I get I wish the devil would be here when I get here because I'm coming to clean house of demons tonight. Mm -hmm. Most of us have gotten so fleshy that demons are not even intimidated by our presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most of us, we, we're so common that the demons offer us a seat at the table. Slide us a drink. Come on, come on in. You cool. When Jesus showed up, before he pulled out his caster out of the demons saw him coming afar off and said, Hey, what you what you what you what you here for? Who you here to see? Don't come casting us out. Listen to the demons. Amen. Don't come casting us out before the time. Yeah. Amen. And then Jesus said, well, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get back on my boat. No. I'll see y'all next month. No, he didn't do that. He was like, well, y'all got to go somewhere. Yeah. They said, well, at least put us in the pigs. Mm -hmm. But the demons see you coming. They know you not. They know you ain't been training. They know you ain't coming to do no work. They know you're not coming to really bring change. So they'll tolerate you for a few minutes because in a few minutes you're gonna be gone, and you're not gonna do anything to disrupt their neighborhood. You're not gonna do anything to disrupt their their system. They're gonna be able to continue to occupy that place as long after you're gone. Because you're not coming in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. You really want to see if you can fit in. Amen. All we have is hamburgers, fries, and shakes. See, we just, we just want to build the kingdom by making disciples. Everybody not going to be a disciple. Ex exhibit B, Jesus came down uh, to the pool of Bethesda. And at the pool, uh, there was, it was known that the angel would come and trouble the water. Right. And if you were the first into the water, then you would be healed of whatever your affliction was. So people came to the pool right. and waited until the water was troubled and then they would jump in. And then Jesus walked up on how many people? Just the one guy sitting by the pool right. and he asked him, would you be made whole? And the guy explained to Jesus how healing works at the pool. He said, well, when the angel come, then somebody beats me into the water. And that's why I'm still here in my current situation. That meant there was a whole lot of people there. Why didn't Jesus heal everybody at the pool? Everybody didn't want to be healed at the pool. Why is Jesus prejudiced? And he only asked that one person. I bet you he didn't. 
I bet you he asked more than that one person. I bet he offered several people the opportunity to take up their bed and walk. But they decided to wait on the angel or to continue being sick. That don't mean stop. Go to the next person and the next person and the next person and give them the opportunity to be healed. Amen. Give them the opportunity to be delivered. Give them the opportunity to be set free. But you got to be activated into that process. Well, Cannon, we don't know enough. We don't know how to do that. Then that's what that's what we need to be focused on. That's what we need to be focused. That's our problem. See, all we got is hamburgers, fries, and shakes. What have we been focused on? The sick and shut-in list. We've got so much to do. Our church is not full tonight. Even socially distant, our church is not full. The church down the street ain't full either. And the church around the corner and the church in the next neighborhood is not full. Most of our churches are not full. If you're a pastor that's watching, most of your churches are not full. If you have a ministry, if you got a women's ministry, you're not getting enough people out to support it or participate. If you're working with youth, you're not overrun with youth. You don't have a problem where you don't have a big enough place to hold all of the children that you're reaching. If you're working with senior citizens, you don't, you don't have a problem where you got so many people that you can't get them in the van or you can't get them. Our problem is not that we're exceeding our capacity. Our problem is that we are not even coming close to reaching our target and our goal because we have not been focused on selling hamburgers and fries and shakes. We've been doing everything else that we can. We've been trying to offer them gimmicks and beg them and, and have annual days and pew rallies and chicken dinners and everything but heal the sick and everything but uh, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what we've got to get focused on so that we can build the kingdom by making disciples. And God is calling you. And God is calling us. It's if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. I heard some people say it don't take all of that. I heard some people say that uh, that's just not how we do it. You don't have to do it like I say, but it has to get done. And if the way you're doing it is not getting it done, then that ain't working. And if it's not working and somebody dies, then that's you missed. In baseball, you get three strikes and then you're out. You get a foul tip, they give you another swing. But if you get a strike after that, you're still out. How many strikes do you have? See, we got to get back focused on what do I have to do to be good at that? We got people, Keith, that's true. they want to be uh, super duper leaders. They want to be pastors. They feel like they're called for next level ministry and, and anointed and appointed for this season and all of that stuff like that. But where is the fruit? You you want you wanna you wanna take this and, and, and Cece gonna take this and start her own church. Right. Yeah. But when she take this and start her church, she didn't do the kingdom assignment. Mm -hmm. If you can't build it in your in, in somebody else's church, you can't build it when you get your own. Yeah. It don't matter how, how good they preach or don't preach. It don't matter how good their building is or isn't. Because when you get your good building, they still not coming. Amen, Amen Pastor Ken. If you still tell them the truth, I didn't even know you could preach this good. Amen. I'm just doing the best I can. When you get your when you get your new your new ministry and you change the name and you get your shiny logo and website and, and all of that stuff like that, they're still not gonna come. They're not gonna come because not because you're not good. It's because you haven't gotten proficient at making disciples. And making disciples means that you have to do what? You have to first get your three. Then you got to teach them to get three. Then you got to teach them to get up to teach other people. Then you're building the kingdom. It doesn't matter what it is that we're selling. It's going to work. 
It doesn't matter if we're selling coffee or life insurance. It's going to work. It doesn't matter if we're selling vitamins or, or, or makeup. It's going to work. It's going to work. Why? Because we're putting it in the distribution center that we've got. And what, what are we distributing? It, we, we're distributing salvation. We're distributing healing. We're distributing deliverance. We're distributing peace. We're distributing joy. We're distributing love. We got a lot of things that people want and that people need, but we're keeping it in the truck. We've got to get it out in the hands of the people, in the lives of the people, so that we can make a difference. This is what the God is calling for at this time. This is what we have to be focused on. How do you do it? Figure it out. Figure it out. What do we have to do to get three people to the next meeting? If your meeting is on Zoom, how do you get three people? I mean, can you get three people on the Zoom to have Bible study? Can you take this Bible study and have a watch party with three people? Will three people watch it with you? Can you, can you do discipleship like that and have a discussion? Can you discuss a scripture of the day with three people on, on a chat? Whatever you have to do to make disciples, then make sure that you're focused on doing that. Anything else is a distraction. Anything else is a deception that keeps you from doing your principal function of building the kingdom by making disciples. I hope this has helped you. I hope that you learned some things here that you can apply. I hope that you, I challenge you to find creative ways to get out and be active in big king, kingdom building right now. And don't let time pass, and don't let people pass. We're depending on you to make it happen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give God a hand of praise. Amen.